There are many definitions of poverty. However, I like the definition that defines poverty as a state in which people do not have enough money to meet basic needs including food, clothing and shelter, which impacts inequalities in income distribution and access to productive resources, basic social services and opportunities. Zambia one among the most beautiful countries in the Commonwealth. Isn't at its full potential? Did you ever wonder why? In the 1880s, the British began securing mineral and other economic concessions from various local leaders and the territory eventually became known as Northern Rhodesia. Zambia eventually came under the control of the former British South African Company and was incorporated as a protectorate of Northern Rhodesia in 1911. During the 1920s and 1930s, advances in mining spurred development and immigration. The name was changed to Zambia upon independence in 1964. The current population of Zambia is almost 20 million. Zambia comprises an amazing 72 ethnic groups most of which are Bantu speaking, with about 90% of the population falling into nine major ethno-linguistic groups. Economic Overview According to the World Bank, Zambia's total external debt was 10.7 billion in 2019, which is equivalent to around 45% of its GDP. Zambia is a lower middle income sub-Saharan economy, major copper exporter, high public debt is held mostly by China, systemic corruption, one of the youngest and fastest growing labor forces, regional hydroelectricity exporter, extreme rural poverty. Poverty in Zambia is the result of decades of economic decline and neglected infrastructure. According to UNICEF, approximately 1.4 million children under the age of five are estimated to be acutely malnourished. Zambia possesses one of the world's highest grade deposits of copper and is ranked the seventh largest copper producer in the world. In addition, Zambia is home to small exploitable deposits of cobalt, nickel and manganese. Copper contributes over 70% of the country's foreign export earnings. Zambia is one of the world's largest producers of copper and cobalt. And it's estimated that the country's mineral wealth is worth around 20 billion US dollars. It is difficult to estimate how long Zambia's mineral resources will last, as it depends on many factors, such as the rate of production and exploration. However, the government of Zambia has estimated that the mineral resources could last up to 100 years depending on how they are managed. The northern province of Zambia hosts the poorest people and is the least developed in the country. There are marked differences between rural and urban areas. Poverty in rural areas is much higher than in urban areas, with the increase in poverty in rural areas stemming largely from low and deteriorating levels of agricultural productivity. Zambia's poor but youthful population consists primarily of Bantu-speaking people, representing nearly 70 different ethnicities. Zambia's high fertility rate continues to drive rapid population growth. However, the country's total fertility rate has fallen during the last 30 years and still averages among the world's highest. Largely because of the country's lack of access to family planning services, education for girls, and employment for women. Zambia also exhibits wide fertility disparities based on rural and urban locations, education, and income. The poor uneducated women from rural areas are more likely to marry young, to give birth early, and to have more children, viewing children as a sign of prestige and recognizing that not all their children will live to adulthood. HIV AIDS is prevalent in Zambia 
and contributes to its low life expectancy. Zambian immigration is low compared to many other African countries and is comprised predominantly of the well-educated. The small amount of brain drain, however, has a major impact in Zambia because of the limited human capital and lack of educational infrastructure for developing skilled professionals in key fields. For example, Zambia has few schools for training doctors, nurses, and other healthcare workers. Its spending on education is low compared to other sub-Saharan countries. Governance. The government type is a presidential republic. It has 10 provinces, Central, Copper Belt, Eastern, Loapula, Lusaka, Mashinga, Northern, Northwestern, Southern, and Western. The Independence Day is on the 24th of October. And the Zambian government is generally considered to be effective in serving its citizens. The government has taken steps to improve the quality of life for its citizens, including investing in infrastructure, providing access to quality health care and education, and promoting economic growth. However, when we look at the performance indicators of the government, as estimated by the World Bank, most of the indicators are less than 50% meaning that they still have a long way to go to improve indicators on control of corruption, government effectiveness, political stability, the quality of regulations, rule of law, and voice and accountability. Some facts about poverty in Zambia. Over 70% of the total population lives on less than $1 a day. There's lack of access to nutrition food, resulting in high consumption of unhealthy diets, including an over-reliance on maize, has led to the problem of obesity, particularly for young women. Poverty is worse in rural Zambia, where 88% of the people live below the poverty line. Even in urban Zambia, Approximately 70% of urban dwellers live in slums. Disparity between rural and urban areas are also considerable, with 64% of urban Zambians having access to safe water compared to 27% of their rural counterparts. Zambia's population is rapidly growing and more stress is expected to be placed on demand for jobs, healthcare, and other services. So my name is Mwangi Bernard. I'm from I'm a Kenyan uh, in Africa. I'm a public health uh, specialist. I deal specifically with the uh, adolescence and sexual reproductive health. Uh, this web we try to empower uh, young girls and boys about their sexuality uh, using all uh, available means. Uh, previously, I've been working with uh, MSI International. So our core business has been to increase uh, the access of uh, sexual reproductive health, uh, both knowledge and commodities to the most vulnerable people in the community. Uh, so far, so good. Uh, we've seen tremendous uh, gains. Uh, however, we are not yet there, but uh, we're still optimistic. Yeah, thank you. That's me. Thank okay. you very much for joining us. Um, I had you, I had basically two questions for you. Uh, yes. The first question was that uh, in your experience, as uh, you know, in dealing in 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 health, and especially sexual health, and with adolescents and boys and girls and stuff, um, you've you've got an insight into the way programs are structured and how they are delivered. Yeah. Now, in your in your opinion. Uh, how effective have you know the the programs in uh, in motivating teenagers and and other of your target group? Uh, how how effective has that been? 
Yeah, I can say in a scale of one to 10, we are still loaded there, we are at around six. So yes, we are trying. I'll speak it into two perspectives, one from the government and the other one from the NGO, the private, uh, the private sector. Uh, so what is happening in the, the landscape is that um, the government has been trying, although the, the reproductive policies and laws in Kenya have been very restrictive in terms of uh, the, for example, the comprehensive sexuality education in schools, there has been a slow adoption of the policies and implementation of some of the programs in schools due to resistance from uh, the, the, the culture, some of the uh, reserved uh, religion and stuff like that. But the government has been trying with the continued advocacy, we've seen some uh, political goodwill and uh, some of the policies have now been changed in favor of uh, the, the community. And uh, in this respect, we're uh, targeting the adolescents and youth. So yes, the government is trying, uh, however, we are not yet there. Uh, also, the other hand is that the public or the NGO, the NGO, uh, the donors are also trying. Uh, we have some interventions and uh, we are currently working uh, with communities and uh, uh, the basic setup in the communities is the pharmacy. So the donors are targeting, the non-governmental organizations are targeting pharmacies to create uh, very effective programs which are user-centered uh, and uh, they are targeted to the youth specifically. So we find with these interventions, uh, there's hope. There's hope. Well, actually, we just released, uh, the, the ministry released uh, the demogra demographic health survey the other day and uh, We've still not attained what is expected, but there's a great reduction in terms of uh, teen pregnancies from an 18% 18 percent in 20, 2015 to now 15 percent. So there's a reduction in the teenage pregnancies due to all these interventions. And we all know that uh, if we want to keep uh, a girl in school, we'll secure the future and also the socioeconomic development will be achieved. So all I can say is that uh, all efforts are geared towards uh, maintaining the girl in school and uh, we are trying, we are almost there. When you talk about teenage pregnancies, do you mean the age group of, um, let's say, 12 to 19? About uh, 10 to 19. 10, 10 to 19. 19. Yeah, those are the, we call them here in secondary school and they are graduating now to college. So they are the most vulnerable group due to so many uh, economic reasons and uh, they are bringing, in terms of exposure to the sexuality education in schools, we still have uh, reserved cultures and also the system, the education system itself is a bit reserved. So they are the most vulnerable, the 10 to 19 years. Of course, of course. According to a bit of, just a bit of research that I've done, I mean, I'm, I've not really uh, experienced much of it, but are, are, uh, are marriages of girls and boys within this 10 to 19 age group, are they still prevalent in Africa? I mean, in, in say Kenya, where you are? Yes, the numbers are high. We, we, and uh, this can be justified by uh, the survey that was just uh, out. In some counties, it's so high above 27. So that means there are a lot of uh, school dropouts. The education levels are just basic. So yes, it's a problem. An average, a national average of 15% uh, of those 10 to 19 are having the teen, uh, are mothers at some point. And some other counties going up to 27% and 30. So yes, it's quite a significant problem apparently. And that's why we have all these interventions by both the private, the NGO and the government. Well, see now, if, if I, what I heard was, what I, what I learned was that uh, because of poverty, families in uh, most, most families who are affected by poverty, they marry off their children, uh, especially the girls, because uh, they just cannot afford sustaining them anymore. So, so they, they, they get them married off early. I mean, even at some, sometimes even when they just enter into puberty. Um, so is that, is, is poverty a, a significant cause yeah, for yeah. such things? We cannot say it's poverty specifically, although it's the biggest contributor. We also have this uh, thing called cultural aspect. 
So like in the northern counties in my country, the semi-arid areas, you will find that uh, they are, the economic activity there is uh, they are past pastoralists. So they have livestock and uh, they move from one place to the other with livestock. And they value livestock so much. So uh, a homestead or our father would rather marry off her daughter and get the bride price in terms of cows rather than take her to school. And also from the survey, we found that like now a county called, uh, that is in Sam Samburu, 50% of the teenage pregnancies, of the 10 to 19 pregnancies are teenagers, 50% of all the pregnancies there. Wow. So you, you find uh, we need also county specific interventions in order to mitigate such issues. And specifically is to address the root cause that is uh, culture in relation and poverty. Yeah. 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 No, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Your organization and the NGOs appear to be doing a very noble job. But and what about government? I mean, how, how are their systems working? Are, are they are they making any kind of difference? Mm, not so much. Uh, for the longest time, I think we've lacked some political will and also yeah, political goodwill from the executive and also the government. A case in point is uh, the health system funding. You find that uh, primary health care funding, specifically like in my country, sometimes is not uh, that good. It goes depending on the mood of the government of the day. So sometimes the funding, like apparently, is about 5% of the national budget. However, you find from literature and whatever, the, the Abuja Declaration recommends that uh, the funding should be at least 15% of the national budget, which is not yeah. the case. So wow. yeah, no, we, yeah. we tend to find the, the government is not doing a, a, entirely what it's supposed to do. However, we remain optimistic because we, we they, they are trying, they're trying at, at uh, previous year, it was 3%, now it's 5% uh, funding of the primary health care, addressing the key challenges like uh, commodity distribution, mm -hmm. As uh, having health healthcare workers, so I can say like healthcare workers, we have a lot of trained people, but now the facilities are not uh, there or they are not in good condition facilities, and then the commodities in terms of equipment and uh, also the, uh, the 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 consumables, even drugs. So yes, the government is trying. Moving forward, we just had a new government the other day, so we anticipate a lot of changes and a lot of positive. Uh, follow up moving forward. Yeah, no, no, that's great. That's good news. Still regarding systems. Now, the, the new government, you're saying that uh, you, your uh, people are expecting uh, some resolution to to the yeah. primary health care systems and, and health in general. Um, can you elaborate any more on that? Are they going to increase their budget allocation for health? Yeah, yeah. So as we speak, we have, uh, we can say it's a new government with the old budget. So we've not seen their input yeah. exactly. However, yeah. they have their plan, which is called the manifesto. Uh, moving into the future, we are seeing uh, as if they'll try to prioritize more on uh, primary health care. So in conjunction with the Council of Governors, this is a body that uh, uh, liaises between the county governments and the national governments. We have a lot of interventions and a lot of uh, systems being put in place. Key among them is uh, uh, like now operationalization of the National Hospital Insurance Health Fund. Eh? We call it the NHIF. So we are looking at, uh, we are looking at uh, having around 40% of the population being paid being paid by the state, the, the monthly subscription for the insurance fund. This will go a long way in, uh, in ensuring that uh, basic things are taken care, like the, the cancer patients, we have the patients on dialysis. It's so it has been so costly to them, but if the government can intervene as per the promise, we are seeing as if the there will be some positive results. Mm. Yeah. No, that's good. That's great. Mm. Um, before we close, is there something you'd like to ask me? There is a worry about the donor landscape. You see, the government cannot do all these things uh, alone. So from where you sit, maybe I would like to know if you have any influence or you can do something maybe 
to turn around or even maybe influence some positive uh, and increased funding to these uh, uh, low and middle income countries? Is there a way we can influence the donor landscape? Because of late they've been withdrawing this inflation across the globe. So is there something we are supposed to do or we just hope, wait, sit and wait? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I know, I know. I, this, this situation is very, uh, I mean, it, it's very dire, I guess you can call it. Um, mm -hmm. as, as people see your, uh, your request and your appeal, I'm quite mm -hmm. sure that people will get in touch with you. So thank you very much, Bernard, and uh, I, will, I will keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate. And uh, I'm also open. I'm just joining a program evaluation as a consultant. Perhaps maybe you can uh, send some referrals my way or some networking or connections there. Of course. Of course. Thank we'll you. try. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I'll see you. Uh, yeah. Bye. Bye. Population below the minimum level of dietary energy consumption, also referred to as a prevalence of undernourishment, shows the percentage of the population whose food intake is insufficient to meet dietary energy requirements continuously. 17% of the population in Zambia was in hunger in 2019. Food insecurity. Severe localized food insecurity due to reduced incomes and localized shortfalls in cereal production. Cereal production declined to a below average level in 2022 and along with the impact of rising food prices, the number of food insecure is foreseen to increase at the end of 2022 to levels above 1.6 million which is equivalent to an IPC phase three crisis in the first quarter of 2022. Due to high food prices coupled with extreme poverty, families spend 64% and above of their incomes on basic food needs. The effects of poverty are seen in children's development where more than one third of Zambia's under five year population is stunted due to malnutrition. Zambia is considered an agriculture country. Agriculture is the main source of employment and income for many people in Zambia. And it accounts for about 19% of the country's GDP. Agriculture products such as sugarcane, cassava, maize, milk, vegetables, soya bean, beef, tobacco, wheat, and groundnuts are grown there. Land use. Of the 32% of agricultural land, only 5% is arable. There are no permanent crops. The permanent pastures are around 30%, the forests around 66%, and categorized as other is around 2%. The GDP composition by sector is agriculture contributes about 8%, industry about 35%, and services contribute about 57% to the GDP. The labor force by occupation is agriculture provides 54% of the labor, industry about 10% and services about 35%. Zambia is generally considered to be peaceful. The Global Peace Index ranks Zambia as the 57th most peaceful country in the world out of 163 countries in 2020. About 18% of the country's rural population requires urgent action to protect their livelihoods. 
A further 15% are only marginally able to meet their food needs, while 3% of the country's 17.8 million people are already facing considerable food gaps. The main drivers are low prices of minerals in the world market, low agricultural productivity due to climate change, power and fuel shortages, and diseases outbreaks in addition to high deforestation rates and high levels of corruption. Zambia is not considered to be food secure. According to the World Food Program, approximately 3.3 million people in Zambia face food insecurity. According to UNICEF, an estimated 11,000 children in Zambia die from malnutrition and starvation every year. A study by the World Bank generally confirms the common perception that Africa's rural household enterprises operate largely in survival mode, although a small portion of them are highly productive. The most common household enterprises in Zambia are farming, small-scale manufacturing, and trading. Other common household enterprises in Zambia include beekeeping, charcoal production, brick making, and wood carving.